first candidate to make her opening statement is Nicole Townsend. Ms. Townsend, please come on down and, and make your one minute opening statement. Good evening. My name is Nicole Townsend and I'm running for Asheville City Council in collaboration with my dear friend Kim Roney. I'm the proud granddaughter of Mississippi sharecroppers who had to flee their home due to white supremacy. I didn't wake up one morning and say I'm going to make a difference in my community so let me go run for city council. I've been organizing in this community for over 10 years as it relates to police accountability and racial equity. Some of the work that I am most proud of is the work that I have been doing to eliminate the cash bail system, where across the country we have bailed out over 400 black mothers and reunited them with their family. Thank you. Our next candidate is Larry Ray Baker. Hi, thank you guys for coming. Uh, my name is Larry Baker. Um, I was born and raised in Asheville, and I've always wanted to see this place grow and prosper. I've seen it nothing but decline in the recent years, and I just want to make it like it was when I was a kid again. Just beautiful. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, I guess I'll close with that. Our next candidate is Sage Turner. Hello, everyone. My name is Sage Turner. I'm running for city council because I think together we can take better care of our community and of the people in it and how we grow and how we all thrive. I've lived in Asheville for 20 years and raised my family here. My son Dylan, I see him in the back, recently turned 18 and will be voting this year. Uh, I have served many roles in the community in my 20 years, mostly uh, on boards and commissions as a volunteer. I currently serve as the chair of the city's affordable housing committee and the chair of the downtown commission. My job is at the French Broad Food Co-op where I am the finance and project manager. And I've been there for a number of years and I'll be working on our new store very soon. Um, as your city councilor, I will champion affordable and accessible affordable housing and work with a group of leaders to create 1,000 new affordable units by 2025. I will advocate for smart and responsible growth that supports walkability, transit use, and solutions that don't overwhelm our neighborhoods. I will also work to improve climate resiliency, our inequities, our education outcomes, thank you, and, and to protect and grow our local businesses. Just for everybody else, is the beep, the time is up? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Our next candidate is Rich Lee. It's on. Hi, everybody. My name is Rich Lee. I'm a financial advisor. I'm the chair of the city's Multimodal Transportation Commission. I've been your champion on dozens of nonprofit efforts and neighborhood groups, and I'm running to be your representative on Asheville City Council. I'm excited to get into the issues, but I want to talk a little bit about what I can offer. As chair of the city's Multimodal Transportation Commission, I have helped spearhead an overhaul of the city's transit system that makes buses more reliable and more frequent. I, um, we're on the verge of extending service hours to help more late shift workers get home. I've been involved in hundreds of sidewalk, um, park, greenway, street, and bus shelter and bus projects that touch every corner of the city. As your neighbor, leading groups of neighbors, I've helped get traffic calming for dangerous streets and took developers on for bad projects, and I've won. You can vote for my record and know what you're going to get. Steady advocacy and a better Asheville for everyone. Our next candidate is Shane McCarthy. Thanks, Rich. Uh, I'm Shane McCarthy. I was born a few hundred feet that way in Mission Hospital and raised here in Asheville, so I've seen how our city has grown and changed around me. Um, I have, uh, I'm a first generation college graduate. I have a degree from NC State University in civil engineering. And I worked at an engineering firm where we designed roads. I worked at the North Carolina Department of Transportation where we oversaw highway projects. And now I live here with my uh, amazing wife, Emily, and our dog in the East End neighborhood. And I work at a, uh, as a construction manager at a remodeling company. So I'm running for Asheville City Council because I want to be able to afford to live here in five years. The, the price of housing in the city has just skyrocketed so much, and it's pushing out the workers who keep our city running. It's pushing out people who have lived here their entire lives. That's unacceptable to me. So that's why I'm running, and uh, it is time for a new generation of leadership who has the determination and the motivation to address our problems. Thank you. Our next candidate is Kim Roney. Good evening. My name is Kim Roney, and I'm a piano teacher, service industry worker, and community advocate who's running for city council. 
I've been showing up to city council meetings for five years. I've only missed three for the past five years. And I've been reporting back from boards and commissions at about 12 to 20 hours a week because I know so many of us can't be in the room when decisions are being made. The work that we need to do in our community to address equity and be better prepared for climate change isn't some work that can be done alone. We're gonna to have to work on this together. We need deeply affordable housing, a transit system that works for us and gets cars off the road, and participatory democracy that ensures <coughs> equity around our budget, planning, and policies. Thank you to the Mountain Express and to everyone who is participating in this to make sure our voters are informed. Thanks. Our next candidate is Sandra Kilgore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sandra Kilgore, and I'm running for Asheville City Council. <laughs> Why am I running? I'm running for Asheville City Council because I care about the future of Asheville. I'm really concerned about some of the things that have happened or that are happen that have happened and are happening here. I'm a native. I left here over 30 years ago. I, <laughs> I returned about uh, 12 in 2012, and when I got here, I was just really shocked at all the changes. Uh, people were losing homes in foreclosure. Uh, and what I actually did was start a foreclosure program to try to help people sell, save their homes. At present, I have my own real estate company in the neighborhood in which I grew up. I'm also a member of the Planning and Zoning Board, and that has given me great insight to what's really going on here in Asheville, and I figured that I could actually help and, do, and make things better. So that's why I'm here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you. Our next candidate is Keith Young. My grandparents were the first family to live in public housing here in the city of Asheville. When I was born and came home from the hospital, my grandparents, my parents brought me home to public housing. And against all odds, they climbed out. They struggled to rent a modest home for a better life. We had a slumlord. Times got rough. My parents had to make some big, tough decisions. So we stood <laughs> up. Against all odds, they figured it all out. And in 1983, we stayed our first night in our newly built home, sleeping on plywood floors. Against all odds, I know what it means to struggle, to grow up in public housing, to be told by teachers you will not succeed, to spend food stamps in the grocery store and have people judge you and your character, to live paycheck to paycheck and hope that the bottom doesn't fall out. Against all odds, this is who I am. I fight for people who live against all odds. And when I make policy decisions, it will always be in the best interest of those who fight to survive in this city against all odds. And our next and last candidate is Kristen Goldsmith. Good evening. I'm Kristen Goldsmith, and I'm running for Asheville City Council because many folks see their ability to remain in Asheville rapidly slipping away. And so I'm going to fight for the everyday people who live and work here. In the last several years, our housing costs have skyrocketed while our wages have largely remained stagnant. And that has forced many folks to move farther and farther out into the county. I grew up in a working class household and I was the first one in my family to go to college. I hold a master's degree in architecture and I worked in that industry for 10 years. So I not only understand responsible and sustainable development, but I will hold developers responsible and accountable for their actions and keep our city's interests at the forefront. For the last several years and since the last recession, I've been a shift worker, which means this is personal for me. That's why I'll fight for more affordable housing, fare-free public transit, and economic opportunities, including, including living wage jobs for Asheville. Thank you. You guys want to clap? So we will ask that you hold your applause um, throughout round one. Now each candidate will be given um, a question, and each will have one minute to answer. The questions are meant to allow for more in-depth responses. Please be respectful of the one minute time limit. We're gonna start with this question. What new strategies would you champion to ensure that Asheville residents can find the housing to rent or buy that is affordable? And we're gonna start with Goldsmith. Thank you for the question. So I'm focused you wanted us to stand, didn't you? I'm focused on keeping Asheville livable for all the folks who live and work here. And that means folks who've been pushed out into the county. I want those folks to be able to afford to come back to Asheville. My strategy for that is to take a deep dive into our city's policies. That includes our zoning policies. 
I am an advocate for a policy called upzoning, which would allow multi-family housing in our single family neighborhoods. What I mean by that is, think of those units in Montford, those four unit, those four unit buildings where multi-family housing exists and blends right into the neighborhood. That will increase our housing stock and allow more folks to afford to be able to live in Asheville. It's also the opposite of gentrification. It means that our mixed income neighborhoods now afford more folks opportunities. Thanks so much for the question. I'll get straight to the point on that. <clears throat> As a member of the Housing and Community Development Committee, um, I've seen developers, housing developers come through and tell us what their struggles were in producing more affordable housing. We've pumped more money into affordable housing in the last four years than we've done in the last 20. So here's what I would do. I am advocating currently for the city to become its own affordable housing developer. We can utilize what we call lobs and sobs, long and short term obligation bonds in order to, to finance that. We can leverage $1.2 million for $12 million of financing. Some of the largest projects that have been done for affordable housing don't even come to that uh, number. So this is something that the city can get into the game and don't have, we don't have to worry about financing. As long as we can put up the initial funds to do it, and I believe we have the ability and the capital to do so, the city of Asheville should be building affordable housing and making it deeply affordable for everybody in the city of Asheville who needs it. My stance on affordable housing is coming from a different perspective. I think what I would actually do is I would advocate going out, co-oping with private investors and the city to bring in more jobs, living wage jobs. Because guess what? If you don't have the income to maintain the house, it doesn't matter you know, how affordable it is. So we have to do something about bringing in companies that are paying uh, living wages so we can actually afford to have uh, affordable housing. I mean, take care of affordable housing. Thank you. The list of things that we need to do for deeply affordable housing, not just affordable housing we can't afford, can include um, the community land trust is going to need resources of land and money. And we're going to need equity building solutions like the tiny home village that Be Loved and so many of our neighbors are working on. Um, we're going to need cooperative models so that the community isn't constantly chasing leases. Um, we are going to need really high standards for what voluntary inclusionary zoning looks like while we work on mandatory inclusionary zoning legislation at the state. And we're going to have to work on keeping people in their homes, which means expanding our efforts <coughs> for um, opportunities for eviction protection fund, um, a real anti-discrimination ordinance around housing like we haven't seen in Greensboro, and um, home repair so that a dental emergency or a water heater breaking doesn't mean that you lose your home. We've got to do two things for affordable housing. Number one is remove barriers to home ownership. Asheville has about 50-50 renters and homeowners. The United States as a whole is about two-thirds homeowners. We've got to fix that. We're going to do that by expanding our down payment assistance program so that we can afford to buy a home without having to put up a huge sum of money up front. We're also going to invest in our community land trust program so that once we buy those homes, they're going to stay affordable. Uh, when it comes to deeply affordable housing for rentals, that's the, the second thing we need to do. We have people who are on fixed income, who are on disability, who cannot work, and, and they deserve to have a place to stay here and not be homeless. Um, so we need to invest in that using city resources. Developers aren't building it. Um, like Keith, I agree, we need to build it ourselves. We have the authority, we have the funding to do it, and we need to do it in models like uh, Beloved Asheville's Tiny Home Village, which is uh, building equity for residents. I've been heavily involved in that project, and I've been endorsed by Pancho Bermejo, who's the co-director of Beloved Asheville. Thank you. So in my profession, we say that the best way to cope with rising costs is rising incomes. But for too many years, as many of you know who lived in Nashville as young people, wages haven't been rising at a rate that keeps up with the cost of living here. And that's something that I'd like the city to put its efforts to change into change by growing small businesses and living wage employers that are career track employers and prepared to live to work here. But at the end of the day, we're still going to need houses at all price points. Right now, we need something like 3,000 additional housing units in the city just to accommodate the need of the people that's already here. And I ran for this seat in 2015 and in 2017, and I heard many of these ideas. The ideas are known, but I think we need a champion 
who's willing to get in there and fund the community land trust that has been created but doesn't have funding for its operation, that's willing to claim the land from the DOT that can be turned into affordable housing and change our zoning code to create more housing around transit corridors and places that people want to live. All right, this one matters a lot to me, and I don't think I could sum it up in 60 seconds. Uh, I do have a plan that I've been working with leaders on to create 1,000 affordable units by 2025. And it includes issues and ideas that are new around uh, decentralizing poverty and moving people, rewarding landlords that can accept housing vouchers. If you're not aware, we're returning $2 million a year in housing vouchers because there simply are not enough units. I think that for the sake of time, I'm going to use the framework for which I have developed this plan to create a thousand units. And that is, <clears throat> where we see the risk of gentrification, we need to protect our community. Where we see the risk of loss of housing, we need to intervene. An example is eviction protections. Where we see there is not enough housing, we need to create abundance. And where we see high rents, we need to assist in bringing those costs down. When it comes to public housing, not just public, but affordable housing, it takes forever to get in. I want to work on getting that time down, but at the same time making it more affordable for everybody. Not just for the low class or the high class, but the middle to the high middle class. Um, as everybody has said, build more units. I want to get in touch with uh, high government officials and try to get grants or bonds and trust funds going just for public housing. Um, and zoning, as they've said, we need better zoning. But affordable housing is one that does need to be fixed, and uh, hopefully I am able to do it, and I'll leave it at that. I am a renter because I cannot afford to buy a home here in Asheville, and I have a full-time job. I believe that we need to crew up with cities such as Charlotte, Durham, Greensboro, and Wilmington so we can put pressure on the state to have statewide rent control. There is no reason people who are working in Asheville cannot afford to pay their rent. I was scrolling on Facebook Market last night. And I noticed that there is a one bedroom, one bathroom apartment in West Asheville that costs more than my rent and I'll rent a house. I believe that we need to invest in the community land trust and that we need to make sure that our public land stops being sold to developers and that community members can take that land not pay for it, but take that land. I also believe that we need to invest in community based reparations so that folks who grew up in Montfort can actually afford to live there if they choose. Thank you all. Um, our second policy question, and Ms. Kilgore, I'm gonna start with you, um, and then we'll go in the same order and come back around to Mr. Young. Um, the city has declared a climate emergency that calls uh, for zero net greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Do you agree with that objective? If so, what three concrete actions do you think city council should take quickly to combat climate change? And if not, why not? Okay, I definitely think we have to do something with climate change. The first thing I would do is first educate the community or the city of ways that we can actually all participate in protecting our planet. I think a lot of people are just not aware of all the different things that we can actually do to improve. Uh, I would also uh, be an advocate for the Teslas and all the <laughs> new construction, I mean the new automobiles and things like that to actually help. Um, and also, I would also advocate for renewable uh, energy companies, for support renewable energy companies that could bring in living wage and wages. Wage Living wage jobs. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So when I saw the Cadmus report come out, I was really disappointed because I expected the work was going to be way too hard, way too expensive, and that our community would have a real 
awareness moment that we were actually dealing with an emergency and we were going to treat it like one. I do support the climate emergency. I do stand with our youth in Sunrise. And I do think the work is going to be both hard and incredibly expensive. But I know that it's up to us to do what we have to do to be held accountable for the, the past and moving forward into the future, which is why we need to address economic mobility to stabilize our community that's dealing with incredible wealth gap. Um, I think that we can do that through supporting small businesses and cooperatives. Um, I know that we need to address mobility across the city so that people can get around without a car. And I do think we're gonna have to shore up our um, food and water ecosystems and our tree systems. So protecting our entire ecosystem, not just for us, but for the whole. Yes, I agree with the climate emergency. It is not my grandchildren's future that's at stake here. It's my future. It's my generation. So we have to act and we have to act now. What we need to do about it is we need to build local solar power and bring good paying solar installation jobs to our area that will clean up our air quality and build renewable power. We need to retrofit our buildings to be more energy efficient. Right now, that's the most cost efficient way to save energy. I've been a part of that with uh, volunteering for Energy Savers Network, which weatherizes low income houses. It puts money back into the people of poor, that puts, puts money back into the pockets of poor households while fighting climate change. I've been endorsed by Brad Rouse, who's the leader of that organization. We also need to protect our tree canopy, which has been rapidly declining over the last few years. And we need to do that so it's going to continue to protect us from the, fight, from the effects of climate change, from flooding, from erosion, and from heat waves. So we were asked to do... So we were asked... So we were asked for three things, and I, now I only have 50 seconds, so I'm going to go ahead. <laughs> Um, the first thing I think that we need to do is reverse our loss of tree canopy, which is especially impacting neighborhoods close to downtown and close and low-income communities of color, creating a heat island effect that causes a cycle of more utility and more electricity, more electricity use. With more trees, we could capture more carbon because remember we're aiming for a net zero carbon goal. Second thing I would do is support community solar, solar fields that the, that the whole community can buy into and source their power from that are owned by the community itself. And I would push our local utility monopoly to, add, to move away from fossil fuels and use more renewables in our main electricity source. And the third thing I would do is I would put the city's support behind the Citizen Climate Lobby's Carbon Fee and Dividend uh, Bill, which helps to undo the economic effects of action on climate change that fall the heaviest on low-income families. Uh, so yes. Oh. Check. Yeah. So yes, I do agree. And my three things would be to move our municipal buildings and schools to renewables. We've made a pledge to do that by 2030, but we need to do it sooner. Secondly, I would support, like the others are saying, uh, protections and in increasing and replacing our tree canopy. So that would look like joining Asheville Greenworks Pledge to plant 50,000 trees by 2040. And by the way, I think we should do that sooner as well. Uh, lastly, I would say number three is to fully implement our transit master plan so that we can get our, our community out of vehicles. 77% of us drive ourselves alone in our cars every day and only 1.7% use transit. Yes, I agree with uh, zero net carbon emissions. Firstly, I would uh, try to avoid using fossil fuel power, go more renewable, water, solar, wind, and try to implement that into the buildings as well, have solar panels on the school, on city council buildings, or town halls, anything. And then secondly, uh, tree cover, as everybody else has said. Uh, plant more trees downtown, uh, clean up the atmosphere, the smog, everything else, and it's also better for the soil. And thirdly, uh, traffic. Uh, maybe stricter emissions uh, control and more car pulling. Make it easier to carpool, have public things set up just for carpool. And yeah, thank you. 
oftentimes people who get to benefit the most from our environmental projects, our sustainability, are people who are not low income. We need to talk about intersectionality. Anything that we do that involves climate needs to have a race and class analysis. Yes, let's plant more trees and let's have real conversations that many of our community members have been saying, telling us for years that the reason trees are being cut down in their neighborhoods is so that police can surveillance them better. So why are we going to continue to plant trees that are going to get cut down so our community members can be surveillanced? We need to talk about the issues of over-surveillancing black and brown communities if we're going to talk about climate justice. We need to get more bikes on the road and cars off the road. And we can create safe barriers so people feel safe actually riding their bikes on busy roads. Thank you. The first thing I would advocate for, yes, I do support the climate emergency declaration. The first thing I would advocate for is partnering with Buncombe County for fare free public transit so that folks who live in the county but work in Asheville can take transit to work. Park and ride systems that would allow them to leave their cars behind and would allow all of us to get to and from where we need to go without having to rely on a car would cut our emissions significantly. We also need to fully fund an urban forest plan, an urban forest master plan, and that includes a full-time urban forester. And finally, we need to get serious about being leaders at the city level and pushing on our state legislators to reverse the state policies that require Duke Energy to operate as a monopoly. Until we do that, until we allow others to enter the energy market and create competition in the energy market, we will not be able to make a significant dent in this issue. I've introduced a local Green New Deal for the city of Asheville that includes building North Carolina's largest community solar farm, expanding our transit to fare free and expansion, affordable housing issues. I've also partnered with Julie Mayfield and other uh, community members on a three cent increase in property taxes to fund an urban forester uh, to protect our tree canopy, to expand transit, uh, to work on affordable housing, and the local Green New Deal is gonna be at our next governance committee meeting. So I've already started all of these things that folks are talking about. We just need community support to do those things. So I hope you will take a look at the uh, local Green New Deal that I've uh, asked to be implemented, and also look at the three cent plan that Julie Mayfield and I have put forward to council on this next budget cycle to actually fund all of these things. Thank you, folks. Uh, just a, uh, a little bit of inside knowledge. Some of you guys may be having a little trouble with the mics. There's about a three to five second delay from the time you push, push the button to say on to when it starts working. So that may come in handy in a few minutes again. Right now, you won't need to know that at all because this is our, what we're calling our lightning round. We've given everybody a yes or no placard, and we're going to ask you a series of yes or no questions. Um, and then we're going to ask you to hold the placards up for a little bit. Uh, this is also going to be uh, uh, broadcast, so we're going to go through and say who's, who's holding up yeses and who's holding up noes. Uh, also, some of us are a little slow on the uptake anyway. Um, so, um, and just a, 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 another note, you will get a chance at the end, you'll get a minute to, to close your remarks, and if there's one of these questions you feel like, gosh, I can't answer, you know, I said no, but I want to explain, that's your chance. Is everybody with me so far? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, first question. Yes or no? Asheville City Schools has the largest gap between the proficiency of its white and black students of any district in the state. And the gap only seems to be getting wider in the face of frequent superintendent turnover and despite an above average per pupil budget supported by city and county taxpayers. One, would you support changing the city school board to an elected board, yes or no? Goldsmith, yes. Young, no. Kilgore, yes. Roney, yes. McCarthy, yes. Lee, yes. Uh, Turner, yes. Baker, yes. And Townsend, yes. Number two. Should Asheville City Schools be consolidated into the Buncombe County 
public schools. Goldsmith, no. Young, no. Kilgore, yes. Roney, no. McCarthy, yes. Lee, no. Turner, yes. Baker, no. And Townsend, no. According to the city's urban tree canopy study, released in October, Asheville lost 891 acres of tree cover between 2008 and 2018, or 6.4% of its total canopy. That same study estimates that more that those trees would have provided $8.7 million worth of ecosystem services. Do you support the inclusion of an urban forester and urban forestry master plan in the 2021 budget? That would be a unanimous yes. All right. City Council approved the transit master plan in 2018 which aimed to expand bus service hours by 44% this fiscal year and improve the rider experience. So far, fully implementing phase one of the plan has stalled due to budget shortfalls. First question on this topic. Would you support a quarter cent sales tax increase to pay for extend, excuse me, expanded transit service? Goldsmith, yes. Young, no. Kilgore, yes. Roney, yes. McCarthy, no. Lee, Lee, yes. Turner, yes. Baker, yes. And Townsend, no. Second question on this topic. Do you support eliminating rider, fare, excuse me, rider fares on the transit system? And we, uh, Goldsmith, yes. Young, yes. Kilgore, no. Roney, yes. McCarthy, yes. Lee, yes. Turner, yes. Baker, yes. Townsend, yes. Even accounting for new property tax revenue from the sale of Mission Health to HCA Healthcare, the city is projected to have a structural funding gap, meaning it will spend more on existing services than it takes in from fees and taxes beginning in the fiscal year 2022 to 2023. Do you support a food and beverage tax to generate additional revenue for the city? Only on alcohol. <laughs> okay, we have Goldsmith, yes. Young, yes. Kilgore, yes. Rooney, yes. McCarthy, no. Lee, yes. Turner, yes. Baker, yes. Townsend, yes. All right, my next question. Do you support the proposal to raise the property tax rate by three cents per $100 in valuation to increase funding for transit and climate change initiatives? Goldsmith, no. Young, yes. Kilgore, yes. Rooney, yes. No. Rooney, no. <laughs> Rooney, no. McCarthy, yes. Lee, yes. Turner, no. Baker, no. Townsend, no. During last year's budget work sessions, city staff estimated a need for $330 million in capital projects such as sidewalks, parks, and greenways through fiscal year 2024-25. The city's current capital improvement plan only projects 60 million in spending. Here's the question. Do you support the institution of a regular bond program that takes on debt and pays for it over time using tax dollars to fund capital projects? And we have a unanimous yes. So I'll <coughs> go through the numbers. The Buncombe County Tourism Development Authority collected $25.3 million from occupancy taxes in the last budget cycle per state law. The BCTDA must spend 75% of these taxes, nearly $19 million on marketing and advertising. <laughs> Would you endorse a reallocation of the occupancy tax in Buckingham County 
<laughs> to allow for more spending on public projects. That would be a unanimous yes. And here is my next question. Should the, spend, should the city spend 100 million, including room tax revenue, to renovate Wolf Auditorium? So, that will be Keith Young, yes. Goldsmith, no. Kilgore, no. Rooney, no. McCarthy, no. Lee, no. Turner, no. Baker, no. And Townsend, no. Roughly 160 city employees, including some firefighters, are currently paid less than $15 per hour. In its most recent budget, Buncombe County set its own pay floor for workers at that rate, which impacted its 15 staffers. Here's the question. Do you support raising the minimum city employee wage to $15 an hour? And we have a unanimous yes. The budget for the Asheville Police Department has increased by approximately 18% since fiscal year 2016 to 2017, and now stands at over $29.6 million, the largest single expenditure in the city's general fund. Here are my questions. Does the APD have enough money to adequately address rising community concern surrounding property and drug-related crime? <coughs> That would be a unanimous yes. My second question. APD recently instituted a written consent policy for vehicle searches. Would you support expanding that policy to include pedestrian searches? That would be a unanimous yes. Oh, now it's time to go back to reader source policy questions so that we can hear more one minute answers from you. So we will start with McCarthy and go right down the line. Where in your life can you demonstrate a commitment to equity? What changes to city policies do you think should be made to make them more equitable along racial and income lines? Thank you, that's a very important question. Today, I just released my plan to reform Asheville's education system. So, in 2018, at Asheville High School, 89% of white students scored proficient on English tests. 18% of black students scored proficient. That's 18, one eight. This is the fifth largest achievement gap of any school district in the nation. That is unacceptable. My plan will bring back an elected school board so the citizens have a direct voice on education policy. We will study combining the city and county school districts, and if it will increase student success, we'll combine them. We are going to uh, reduce their exposure, students' exposure to dangerous air pollution from diesel buses and indoor uh, poor air quality. And we're gonna connect students to tutoring services so that students who fall behind can catch up. So you just heard um, Mark read the number for capital improvement projects that are, the city has planned over the next five years. And it was over $300 million. As co-chair or vice chair of the city's Greenway Committee and then chair of the city's multimodal commission, I helped lead the effort to prioritize those projects, especially to prioritize um, Greenway projects, which is something I feel passionately the city is behind pace on and needs to get ahead on by framing them through the lens of which projects add access to communities that traditionally or historically lack access to sidewalks, groceries, jobs, and schools. We made that our highest priority. And as a result of those efforts, sidewalks and greenways and parks and other city efforts are being concentrated in areas that over the two plus decades that I've lived in and around Asheville have historically been neglected. That's something that I've already helped to do, and I can continue to do on council. <laughs> okay. 
So first, in housing. So I was part of the momentum, as many of you were, around supporting the affordable housing bonds. And that specifically created $3 million for land banking, $1 million for the land trust, and $1 million for down payment assistance so that we can move more people into home ownership. Um, also working as part of the group working on the voucher initiative because like I said earlier we are not we do not have enough units that accept vouchers and if you have a voucher in hand it can be used for rent and it can be used for a mortgage it is crucial that we move people into home ownership uh, lastly I support our new Department of Equity Inclusion and the Business Inclusion Manager in their work. So we have funded several positions and created them to inform and look at the entire city policy and how all of us operate as volunteers on boards and committees to ensure that we are using an equity lens when we make big decisions. When it comes to equity, as Shane has mentioned, only 18% of African Americans uh, scored proficient. Only 18. I feel like that number should be way higher than it is. To just because you're of a different color doesn't mean you have less of a right to something, say that a, a Caucasian man has or anything. So diversity and equality for those who can't get what they need, I want to help them out more than those that already have it. Thank you. An equity lens is not equitable if the people who are most impacted by the issues are not involved in creating the lens. Two of the places that I think are intersectional with race and class one includes money bail. I think that we need to build a statewide coalition and join along with the folks in Durham and Greensboro and Fayetteville and Wilmington so that as the state of North Carolina, we can end the system of money bail. I also think we can eliminate food deserts by investing in community-run co-ops. Not co-ops that the city runs, but co-ops where we divest from some things that are not serving us and invest in communities so that they can be the ones creating and leading the co-ops. I'm a firm believer that the zip code where you are born should not determine your outcome in life. With that in mind, I am a huge proponent of upzoning. Like I said, we need to reverse the racist policies of redlining in our history. In addition to that, we have housing choice vouchers going unused in our community right now. I would like to incentivize property owners to build accessory dwelling units on their property, and especially if they will accept housing choice vouchers. I'm also a proponent of more mixed-use development along our primary corridors, and that includes integrated transit. That mixed-use development will include access to food and services in addition to affordable housing. Thank you. Two weeks after I got elected, I was the council member that authored the resolution to ban the box. A month from that, I was the council member that asked city council to make equity and inclusion the number one priority of the city. I was the council member who authored the legislation to write the Human Relations Commission into an ordinance. I was also the council member who formulated with Gary Jackson the Equity and Inclusion Department. I was also the council member that asked the Housing and Community Development Committee to uh, ask developers to accept housing choice vouchers. I've done many of these things. My whole life has been dedicated to equity. I don't know what else I could say. I've got plenty of time, but I will bore you with it. What I'm, My point to you is I'm on the forefront of doing all of these things, and they got done when I came into office. What I'd like to do is work with the city council and business owners to actually design programs that will programs that basically will have training programs and internships for uh, a lot of the people in the community that do not have jobs and do not have training. Um, I would like to see co-ops where we can actually work together to improve the overall unemployment uh, of our community, especially our millennials. I think that we basically need to try to retain the millennials uh, that we have here uh, through a better job 
uh, higher paying wages. Uh, most of my friends tell their kids to go off to college, not to come back to Asheville, because there's nothing here for them. So I would like to see the city working with business people, business owners, to improve the overall job, job market for our community. It really resonates with me when I hear Nicole say that it's not enough to have an equity lens. And I also hear people in this room, like Ms. Betty, tell us that we have to do equity. Um, one of the things that I've done over the past four years is advocate for fare free regional transit. And evidently, it's really popular because we've talked about it a lot here tonight. This is totally doable. But one of the reasons why I'm able to stand up here and talk about it today is not because I did it by myself, but because we advocated for it as a community consistently faithfully with Better Buses Together and Just Economics Policy Advocacy because there are so many people who can't participate in advocating for their needs. We need to remove barriers to participation. That means providing childcare. It means language justice. It means that when we have an invitation for boards and commissions, we can say the meeting will be in English, but we need to send the invitation out not in English so that people will see it and understand that they are welcome in our city hall because it is our city hall. So that's why I'm running on participatory democracy. This is something that we can do, and it's something I think we'll be really proud of. Now it's time for our second policy question based on suggestions from Mountain Express readers. Uh, Sage Turner, we'll start with you, go to the right, and then come back to around to Ms. Goldsmith. Um, some of the topics, topics in city government today include the city's commitment, I already mentioned, to power all operations with renewable energy by 2030 and to expand transit. How do you balance initiatives such as these against the city's responsibility to provide essential services like fire and police, water, streets and sidewalks, and trash collection? So I think for me this comes back to some city planning experience and initiative. So when I say smart and responsible growth, I mean that in a sustainability and a fiscal way and an environmental way. The way that we plan our city, the way that we spread it out, the way that we grow roads, the way that we need new sidewalks, those are costly. And if we focus our development within a planned community on transit corridors, then we do not need to <coughs> spread the city out and increase our costs in ways that will multiply over years. This is what I consider responsible planning. So if we want to fund all of these initiatives, all these great ideas that everyone up here has, we have got to get smart about how we build, where we build, what it costs us, and how it will get done. When it comes to the uh, commitments that we have in place to make them bigger and better, there are going to be shortcomings and there's going to be great comings that come from them. But as a city council member, it is our duty to balance everything out and to make sure everything is done the way it's supposed to be. At first, it might be rough, but over time, it could get easier once we figure out what we're doing and how we're going to do it. So I don't have a long spill for this one. Raise your hand if a city council member has ever called you and asked you what you think about a certain line item on the budget. <laughs> the line items that most impact you, your neighbors. Oftentimes things have to be pitted up against each other. What's more important, this or that? I think that we need to start transitioning as a city to a budget process that is actually more participatory. I can sit up here all day and tell you all the things that I want to prioritize, but we need to have budget work sessions that allows our community to talk about what they want to prioritize. So, no, I'm not going to talk about what I want to balance and what I want to see funded. I want to push so that we can talk about what we want to balance and that we want to see funded. So you're going to hear me talk about a holistic approach. It's going to take a holistic approach to address all of these issues because they're all connected, as we've talked about here tonight. Housing, transit, wages, they're all connected. So they all have to be on our mind. And so in my opinion, it has to be a housing first model. That's how you improve outcomes for folks. 
That includes integrating transit with housing. It, it includes deeply affordable housing. We can't afford not to tackle these issues. I don't want to get off track, so could you restate the question? Sure. Some of the hottest topics in city government include the city's commitment to powering all operations with renewable energy by 2030 and expanding transit. How do you balance initiatives such as these against the city's responsibility to provide essential services like fire, police, water, streets and sidewalks, and trash collection? You don't have to balance them. Core services are already included into the budget. When you talk about the expansion of transit, sidewalks, and everything else, we've implemented over the last four, the three years. Well, since I came into office, we had a need for more roads to be paved. Uh, we had some of the worst roads in the, the state. Uh, we had an exponential need of greater sidewalks. Parks and recreation facilities were crumbling. We need, had a greater need for infrastructure improvements. And in the last three or four years, we've spent more money on that than we have in the last 20, and that's due to our bond program that we need to continue. But as far as the core services are concerned, when you talk about fire, when you talk about uh, 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 police, those sorts of things are already included into the base budget. We don't have to balance those. What we're talking about here is how much money we're putting on top of what we've already spent on expanding services such as transit, building more sidewalks, uh, paving more roads, those sorts of things. How do you fund that? And I've partnered with Julie Mayfield and other community members on a three cent increase to make sure that we do fund those things. Well, this is an inter interesting question because that was the reason I voted no uh, for the uh, free transit because we're already this city is a half million uh, dollars behind uh, in, in uh, funding the transit system. So how do we go to a free transit system when we want to expand it and it's necessary that we spend it because most of our citizens and residents here in Asheville are having to move out further. So they need the transit system. We need to expand it further in the county, working with the county to expand that system. And so for that reason, I just wanted to bring that up. But the one thing, I, I, we all talking about the same issues. Affordable housing, all these things cost money. Transit costs money. What I would like to see is for us to actually diversify uh, the job market here. We need to court more companies bringing in more income to pay more taxes so we'll have the money to fund uh, a lot of the <coughs> initiatives that we've talked about. Because without the money, we still can't do a grow the way we need to. Thank you. Five years of budget hearings and budget votes <coughs> and asking my neighbors to come out and us taking up so much time in public comment. And last budget meeting, I walked home in tears because I know that we are talking with this false narrative of resource scarcity when what I hear Nicole Townsend saying is we need to divest from what's not serving us so we can invest what we need. I would like for us to start talking about the TDA like it's a cup. The TDA is a group of our neighbors that need to be held accountable to joining us in the work to allocate the resources from our occupancy taxes for us all. The Dogwood Health Trust has $70 million that needs to be allocated by November. <coughs> We have the city budget, but for those of you who are running for county commission, as a city council or as a city resident, I live in the county. So we need to break down the walls that have been built that aren't serving us between the city and the county and collaborate for our mutual better interest. Please, let's be about it being better. So the core job of our city government is to provide for the health and security of our citizens, right? That's why we have police and fire. And that's also why we need to invest in affordable housing and protecting our environment. That's health, that's health, uh, health that's safety, that's security. When we plant more trees, we are preventing damage to our infrastructure, we're preventing flooding, we don't have to spend as much on stormwater control. When we build deeply affordable housing to keep people out of homelessness, we don't have to pay to arrest those people, put them in jail, take them to the hospital nearly as much. A housing first approach to homelessness costs three times as much, it saves three times as much money as we spend doing it. So the core services of safety and security are one and the same with the programs that I'm proposing. Has anyone here um, had brown water in the last month? <laughs> Some hands. Um, how about driven on a road that uh, was flooded? So when we 
underinvest in planning the kind of community that we want, and we, when we underinvest in the maintenance of our infrastructure systems, we are costing ourselves more in the long run. We aren't saving money by, by refusing to pave roads, we're costing ourselves money. And here's where it gets complicated. Uh, a major company was going to come in one of these economic development deals and they passed on the city of Asheville, not because we weren't going to give them enough tax dollars or big enough you know, <coughs> sidewalks or anything like that. They passed because they said their, their employees wouldn't be able to afford, living wage employees wouldn't be able to afford housing in the city. When we underinvest in housing, we are costing ourselves as a community. So I, don't, I see the question as a bit of a false choice. The investments that we can make now to improve transit, improve our infrastructure, improve our housing, are going to make this a more prosperous community that can afford the things that we want. So we've reached the point of our programming where our questions will change a bit. These are tailored questions specific to each candidate. Candidates will be given one question about his or her platform, experience, values, etc., and they will have one minute to respond. We're going to start with Larry Ray Baker. City council elections are nonpartisan, but you are the only registered Republican running. How does your affiliation affect your ability to campaign? represent and govern in, an hev in a heavily democratic city? That's actually a really good question. Um, when it comes to Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Green, I don't see it as an individual party. Sure, we're two sides of the coin, but at the same time, we all want the same things. It's just different ways of getting it. When I was in high school, I was given a choice of either becoming a Republican or a Democrat to get st student aid in college. I was young, dumb, didn't realize what I was doing, and actually signed up as a Republican. Um, but how it affects me in a democratic city, I don't see it as a hindrance, but I also don't see it as a push forward. While, yes, it does have its drawbacks, but it also helps me with other party members or organizations that want to go Republican instead of Democrat. The order of these skips around for reasons known to someone. <laughs> <laughs> but this one's for Rich Lee. You have criticized incentives used to lure employers to the area and said Asheville needs to boost small businesses. Would you eliminate incentives and how specifically would you support small businesses? So no, I would not eliminate incentives. But when I look at deals like the New Belgium deal, like the deals offered to build more farms or GE Aviation, these, these big developments or big employers, what I see is an inefficient use of our resources. When here, based in Asheville, we have a proliferation of small, com of small companies. We are the city of entrepreneurs. And we have businesses that are ready to expand and that can hire and that are invested in the community and not going to sell out or take off for the next closest place that offers them a better deal and are willing to take care of their employees who are their neighbors. And so what I would do is I would make sure that the incentives that go to a outside company that's going to bring in its own employees go to our local companies and we grow our prosperity from within. Okay, next question is for Kim Browning. You've been a vocal critic of city council members and city officials on everything from hotel development to climate policy to transit management. If elected, how do you feel that history will impact your relationships with your new colleagues? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, thank you for that. Um, when I show up into a space, I am thinking of my piano students, their parents, who they go to the grocery store with, who they go to school with, who their parents work with, um, the people that I ride the bus with, and I know that sometimes I really bring the fire, and it's because I feel some intense pain in our city, some deep wounds. And I feel that it's time to speak up, that we can't allow the damage to continue. I see the work as harm reduction, and I know that we have caring, compassionate people 
on our city council that are doing hard work every day. And so it is gonna be on me to have those conversations, but I will tell you right now, a lot of the decisions are made in the back when we're not in there being able to watch. So we need you to send people who are faithful to the work that you can trust behind closed doors. This question's for Keith Young. You were the only incumbent running. What's one thing you were most proud of accomplishing on city council? And one thing you wish you had done differently in your first term? I would say the, the one thing that I'm most proud of is my equity work. Um, prior to 2015, nobody was having these conversations. I, I, don't, I, I think there were, majority of councilors were four white men, and in 2015 when I got elected, nobody was talking about equity. It took me tooth and nail to fight behind those closed doors and not in front of the public about getting equity passed on all levels of city government. And now we're having these conversations openly in the public. So that's the one thing I'm proud of. One thing that I would actually change is I asked for participatory budgeting uh, two years ago and I had a conversation with the mayor and vice mayor in private about trying to push that forward. And I regret that I was not successful in moving that to the public forefront. And I hope if reelected that I could do such. So that's one thing that I regret not being as forceful moving public uh, 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 participatory budgeting forward. Nicole Townsend. You were charged with vandalizing a monument to Confederate Civil War General Robert E. Lee and the Dixie Highway located in front of the Vance Monument. How should voters interpret that arrest as they consider your suitability to hold public office? Happy Black History Month. Well, one, we have to stop watering down our black history and pretending as if our, the people that we lift up every February, which we should actually be doing, 365, were not radicals. In order to get what we want, we have to fight. I am not ashamed at my arrest for attempting to remove a Confederate plaque. I think it should be in a museum and not in the middle of our city where people were hurt and beaten in the case of white supremacy. So when I say which side are you on, if you are for the side that says we will no longer honor white supremacy in our city, I'm probably the person you should vote for. If you are not on the side that I just mentioned, I'm probably not the person you should vote for. This question is for Sage Turner. You've called for deploying more police downtown, something critics say would make it harder to fund transit and other city budget priorities. Do you still hold that position and why? Oh, thank you for bringing this one up. I know it's been a very contentious issue. So in my role as the chair of the downtown commission, I see things from a very different perspective and I also work for a business downtown and I'm also on the board of the Asheville Downtown Association which is a collective of businesses downtown. So when this question came before me in 2017 at the Downtown Commission about expanding police specific to downtown, it wasn't for the entire city, we had, let me see if I remember the schedule, Monday through Thursday we had police officers in downtown, two that were available uh, from 8 to 3 p.m. or 8 to 4 p.m. and on weekends Thursday Friday and Saturday night overnight but not during the day so when I was asked do you support expanding this so that we have resources available and community police officers that are trained in different ways that would be there at least seven days a week I had to say yes I do support that downtown was facing a shortage and amongst all these conversations of tourism and people commuting to the city we need oh I'm sorry I'm out of time Sensitive topic. Shane McCarthy. You have been closely affiliated with the Sunrise Movement, which has practiced civil disobedience in its efforts to drive the city forward on climate action. How will you make the leap from young activist to executive level policymaker? All right, all right. Young activist, I like it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, desperate times call for desperate measures. Um, when we have a, a climate crisis, which is 
the number one global threat to our, our survival, to my, my generation's future, we've got to do something about it. And for the record, I did not do anything illegal. Um, but I, I, I think I, I commend the members of Sunrise Movement who were a part of those actions, and I think they did a great job. And as a result of, um, so when we got this, this climate emergency resolution passed at the last meeting, thank you, Keith, um, I was part of getting that off the ground as was, was Kim as well. We, um, we called on city council to pass this climate emergency resolution. I called for it again during the September 20th climate rally and again at another meeting. And I'm really proud of that work. And I think that it's a great measure. We are leading, our city is leading on climate policy and we're not waiting for the federal government. They're gonna follow us, thank you. Um, this question is for Sandra Kilgore. As an Asheville business owner, you have said the city has, quote, growing pains, end quote. How can the city limit or alter growth and its effects without harming its economy? Could you repeat that? Sure. As an Asheville business owner, you have said the city has, quote, growing pains. How can the city limit or alter growth and its effects without harming its economy. The growing pains I speak of are basically it's, it's the growing pains. The growing pains I speak of basically have to do with the racial issues. That was what I was coming from. That's the perspective. And basically, the as far as the racial divide here, when I was here uh, over 20 years ago, it, I think it's worse now than it was when I was uh, growing up here. That is a big concern of mine, because what I'm concerned about is the racial divide is becoming larger and it's affecting all of the people in the community. I think that uh, we need to do something um, about it. We need to bring it to the forefront. And like I said, I grew up here with the UNCA. I felt less racism then than I do today. That was what I was speaking of. Kristen Goldsmith. You are the first of the field to declare your candidacy for Asheville City Council, announcing on May 30th last year. Since then, we've had the hotel mor moratorium, the return to at-large district elections, and the climate energy emergency declaration. How has your campaign platform evolved based on these events since your announcement. Thank you. Yes, I was the first can, uh, candidate to declare for Asheville City Council. And really that came from a motivation on my part to use the experience that I have professionally and as an organizer to bring a voice to Asheville City Council. So honestly, I don't think my platform has changed all that much. Uh, if anything, I've just fleshed out a lot of issues having a lot of meetings with folks, sitting in on boards and commission meetings, and just asking a lot of questions from community members and doing a lot of listening. So from day one, I have been a proponent of deeply affordable housing and policies that I think will get us there. I'm a proponent of more public transit. I've been an avid public transit rider my entire adult life until I moved to Asheville and I was shocked to discover that our public transit system does not work for folks who work a shift job. In addition to that, my economic <coughs> policies and focus have been on bringing living wage jobs to Asheville and diversifying our economy, and that's been the case from day one. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. We are now at the point where candidates get to make closing statements. Tell us what you haven't told us already. Tell us why you've held up a yes or no placard on a question, or tell us what you think of the weather. It's up to you. <laughs> And uh, this also has an order that um, someone knows the rationale for that someone's not me. We start with Shane McCarthy. You have one minute. That was a surprise. Um, okay, well first I just want to say thank you all so much for being here. It is really great. Thanks for Mountain Express for putting on this to put a spotlight on local issues. Um, it was great to really dig into these issues and show that you know we have done our homework. We know what we're talking about and it, it's been a great night. Um, I just want to share, I've, I've been endorsed by uh, Pancho Bermejo, who's the co-director of Beloved Asheville. I've been endorsed by Brad Rouse, who was the 
director of Energy Savers Network, by Daniel Suber, who is the youth coordinator at Word in the Street, and by Kathy Walsh, who is a board member of the Asheville Tree Protection Task Force. So they've gotten behind my campaign. I hope after tonight you will also be behind my campaign. And I think we're ready for a new generation of leadership who has the determination and the motivation to get this stuff done. So thank you so much. I hope I have your vote on March 3. And once again, I'm Shane McCarthy. Thank you all. Next is Kim Maroney. As a community, we are woven together and it's time for us to strengthen our community bond. I've been thinking a lot about what accountability looks like for the long term. A few weeks back, I knocked on the door in Kenilworth while we were canvassing. It was the home of uh, my great-great-grandparents, the house where my great-grandmother was born in 1910. I talked with my great-great-aunt Faye, who lived here in the 20s, about her time riding the trolley, the dance parties with the firefighters, because she lived to be 102. And I talked to her about moving to Asheville. I think about the accountability of my piano students who I've known since they were in elementary school and now they're adults and voters trying to decide if the city has love for them, if they're gonna be able to work and to stay or return here if there's gonna be a home. The work can't be done alone. That's why I'm running with Nicole Townsend. We are sharing an endorsement from Councilwoman Shanika Smith, Councilman Brian Haynes, the Reverend Amy Cantrell, and caring folks like you. I need your vote on March 3rd. We need your vote on March 3rd. Thank you for joining in the work to be about it being better. Rich Lee. All right. Um, I'm not on council yet. Um, <laughs> sometimes people assume I am, and it's cute. But for the last eight years, if you were asked during your day a question about a budget line item or about an action the city was taking, odds are better than even that that question, especially if you're watching this online, odds are better than even that that question came from me. My commitment to informing and sharing the actions of the city with the public to make sure that as many people as possible are aware or included are something that I'm very proud of and that as a city council member I will continue to, to hold all of you in. Because to me, we live in this small, closed-in city, and we have to make it work together. I'm asking for your vote. I'm out of time. I'm asking for your vote, and please catch me after this so that we can talk. Thank you so much. Sandra Kilgore. I have always been one to see a problem and try to solve it, ever since I was a child. And when I got back to Asheville uh, eight years ago, I looked around and I saw a way that I could help. I, through my experience, I have a lot of experience uh, traveling, um, working on planning zoning, um, and I've learned a lot. And through my experiences, I've learned a lot that I could actually share with the city and share with the community. And I think uh, for that reason, I think I would be a great addition to the council because I could unite uh, and the community. Thank you. Sage Turner. I'm going to try and tackle two things because I felt like I didn't have enough, to, enough time last time. And I want to make it clear that I supported the increase of the APD in downtown because we have 11 million tourists a year in a very active business district that had two resource officers at any given moment and not every day of the week. That said, I am worried about Asheville. I am worried that most of us do not own our homes. I am worried that most of us pay more than we can afford for housing. I am worried that the ongoing impacts to that affect education, climate resiliency, all around equity. And I am committed to working on those issues. I am committing to make sure that my 18-year-old son, when he leaves for college this fall, has a city that he can come back to and afford to buy a place and find a good job and I would appreciate your support. Keith Young. I spoke earlier about living life against all odds, and in 2015, I raised the least amount of money and was the number one vote getter in November, and that's because of people like you all who sent me there against all odds. And since I've been on council, I'm humbled because I believe that I've done my best to try to champion the ideals of people in this community who live life every day against all odds. At times I may have been one of the smartest people in the room and not the smartest person in the room all at the same time. 
that doesn't matter. When you get on council, you have to be the most effective. You have to be able to get things done. You have to be able to work with people and you have to be able to move the needle some way, shape or form. And I'm humbled to say that I do believe that I've been effective and that I can continue to work for you and those people in this city who are against all odds. I'm asking for your vote. Larry Ray Baker. I just want to start off by saying thank you all for coming and listening to me. I have no idea what I'm going to say next. Just ramble. Uh, being born and raised in Nashville, I've seen this city grow and I've seen it fall. And I just want to make it grow and be prosperous again. Um, as a council member, I plan on making the city better. But I can't do that without your vote. And I hope that I can count on you voting on me, at least in one of your three votes. But thank you guys, and have a nice night. Kristen Goldsmith. I believe that we have an opportunity in this next election to bring our city's policies in line with our values. And I know that it's going to take a holistic approach to address these issues that we talked about tonight, because like I said earlier, they are all connected. And that's why I believe I'm uniquely suited to be your next representative on Asheville City Council, because I will fight for more mixed use, mixed income, and affordable housing development, including policies that will bring more <coughs> equity to our neighborhoods. I will partner with Buncombe County for fare free public transit, and I will fight for economic policies that will diversify our economy away from solely just tourism and the service industries and bring more living wage jobs to our community. I'm Kristen Goldsmith, and I know that we can build a more livable Asheville together. I'm asking for your vote. Thank you so much. Nicole Townsend. Fannie Lou Hamer was a freedom fighter, and she taught me how to fight. We gon' fight all day and night until we get it right. Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? Ella Baker was a freedom fighter and she taught us how to fight. We gonna fight all day and night until we get it right. Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? Thank you all. In just a moment, uh, Virginia is going to come back up and close us out. Uh, two things before she does that. One, on behalf of Aisha and myself, thank you to those who came. Local government is a place where your vote really, really matters and your interest and activity really really matter so thank you the other thank you uh, goes to the candidates we made you not clap for more than an hour and you did pretty good so let's give them all a big round of applause